This is off planet radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The website is offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins and Emily is here with me. And Hi, uh, we're going to do kind of an end of the year reprise, we'll call it that. Um, we're just going to kind of kick some things around, review the year, talk a little bit about what was important, what happened, the things that we liked, the things that sucked, the things that worked, the things that didn't. What, what works for us is having connection with the audience. And to that end, this year was really a watermark for us because putting this platform together on Patreon was the first step for us to be able to begin interacting with people in a closer kind of, I guess we would say, actually with purpose. That's a good way to put it, with purpose. And value for value kind of exchanging between us all the things that are meaningful and having a group of people there that have kind of become um, advisors inside group of people who input to us. All of our input comes through various sources and is all important to us. But it's important to us that we have the pulse of the people that listen to us. So that's the first thing about 2017 is that it has been a year of us establishing a platform to begin connecting on more of a personal basis. And so this marks the end of 2017, which I believe was the year when the unveiling actually happened. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that. And the ramp up to 2018 heading into 2020, which I think is the next level. M, what sayest thou? Hi, everybody. So can't believe we're already at the end of the year. Like, this time has gone by so, so quickly. Um, yeah, uh, this has been like a really, for the most part, this has been a really amazing, incredible year. And, and I echo Randy's sentiments that really the best thing about this year for me has been interacting with all of you, um, which I really started doing pretty early on in the year before, because we knew we were going to shoot towards this Patreon thing. And I really wanted to sort of um, start touching base with people, finding out what they wanted, just getting to know people. So I've had uh, Skype chats or lengthy Facebook chats or phone chats with many members of our audience starting back earlier this year and, you know, continuing on now, obviously with Patreon and our group chats and whatnot. And that has been really, um, a really cool and really rewarding um, part of that, this. And, you know, I thought maybe just before, since this is the last show of the year, before we kind of get going into our review, we should let people know about some of the changes that are coming after the first of the year. So I will do that right now. So All right. we've been experimenting with the whole thing with Patreon and, you know, this is a new thing for us. And for right now, because, you know, we're at the point here where we're trying to push out the same, you know, our usual amount of off planet radio, and we're also creating bonus content and it's coming in the new year. We will have some new offerings. Um, we're not exactly sure on dates and stuff of that yet, but we're really working on that. So we have to figure out a way that we can sort of, but at the same time, we're not at the point yet where we have, um, you know, enough support coming in that Randy and I can cut back on our jobs. So we're really trying to, you know, we Tetris time in to do all of this stuff. Um, and so one of the things we decided to do, and um, after much consideration, we've kind of tortured ourselves over this and, been, you know, it took us a while to get here, but we will be moving to the uh meth the pro the um the, we're going to be moving to splitting the show and only the first hour of the show will be available publicly the second hour of the show will be available to all of our patrons 
at the uh, at the three dollar and above level. That's the, yeah. the, the that's the lowest level we offer. That's There's right. a few other people who make donations that are smaller, but they don't necessarily get any, anything for that other than the appreciation of Randy and I. Our levels begin at the three dollar level. So the way the th they'll pretty much stay the same. But I'll just go through it real quickly so people understand. For three dollars, you will get. Um, the second half of the show, you'll get the second hour of the show. We will put it on there as a complete show, but what goes up on YouTube or on Facebook will only be the first hour. So on exactly. Patreon, yeah. all of our patrons will get the full show. Um, and as a $3 supporter, you'll also get occasional um, blogs and occasional, sometimes we put in some of the things from the higher levels so you guys can sample that out and see if you like it. So you'll get occasional other material. The $5 level, you'll obviously get the whole show. Everything the $3 level gets, you'll still get the bonus video content, which are sometimes a little impromptu mini podcasts Randy and I make, or some of the little rants we make, or sometimes we have a little after show with somebody, so yeah. you'll get those. People at the $7 level will get all the prior rewards, plus they are able to um, participate in our monthly group chat. We really would love if more people, you know, we have lots of people who are at that level who haven't been able to make it yet, so we're looking forward to meeting all of you, and we'd also love it if some of you guys who are doing a three or five would you know bump up and come to join us for this because it's it's super awesome and it's really cool just to meet other like-minded people and we're i think randy and i are enjoying it just as much or more than <laughs> than than the yeah. participants it's yeah. awesome and so then the ten dollar level gets all of the previous rewards and then after six months of of support you are and, and, and Every six months after that, this will occur too. It will be a different gift. But the f after six months of support, you will get a um, thumb drive with some special archived editions of um, Off Planet Radio. So we'll pick like a certain topic and then kind of go through and put all the, uh, the episodes that have sort of been related to that together. We'll do different things each six months. And then at the $20 a month level, you will get the, all of the previous rewards plus uh, after six months, a commemorative piece of Off Planet Radio art. We already have them. We're trying to figure out what we're going to do with, with the art, exactly how we're going to present it. But we have some really cool designs that have been made for us. Um, and so, yeah, and then, yeah, we'll have to, we'll, there'll be commemorative things for each season. At least that's what we're looking at for right now. Um, and then yeah. just also want to say there's a few people that have chosen to uh, contribute at higher levels than $20. And it's just out of their own uh, the goodness of their heart and whatever and we are really appreciative of, of everyone who contributes uh, you know what i mean we know that financial times are tough and that you know you have choices in how you spend your money and whatever and we really appreciate the support that's what we're going to be doing after the first of the year and uh hopefully sometime next year we will be able to move the entire thing over to our own off planet media or uh, off planet radio dot, you know website and then when that happens there'll be some changes to how we do things yeah. But so know that that is our ultimate goal, not just because, for many reasons. Obviously, we don't, we, you know, having Patreon and PayPal in the middle creates, you know, they, they, we're giving them a lot of money. So obviously, that's one reason. But the main reason being is that we want to be able to completely curate the experience for you as well as offer safe and secure methods of communicating with both us. And Ultimately, the goal of all of this is to build a community of intentionality. Yeah. Yeah, an and, online intentional community and that, you know, that has a forum and a message board and you know, chat rooms and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. we have to make sure it's secure because of, yeah. because of the backgrounds of a lot of the people participating in this and just because of privacy in general. Um, and also because, you know, we want to be able to make plans going forward. And we, those plans are for us. They're not for everybody else to know about. You know what I mean? So uh, they're for our group, for people who are communicating and, and, and participating with us and, um, you know, creating, you know, creating our way out of this mess because <laughs> it's a fucking mess. I think as Emily knows this has been a difficult transition for me I've for years felt very strongly about keeping the public the content public and the, and the content free because that's what I've done for nearly nine years and at the same time it's been a battle internal with me for a long time as I've watched because this is not new um, this model of splitting shows between the public flat platform and a paid platform, it goes back, you know, in our, in our realm anyway, back to the days of Red Ice, where the, basically the public hour was put out as um, a YouTube video. And then, of course, you could get the extended content by becoming a member on Red Ice or becoming a member on any of a number of platforms such as this and i never had a problem with it i've subscribed to all of them 
Mm -hmm. um, I had a problem with it largely because of my commitment at the time to try and really push the envelope on how far we could take the material that we're doing and how much penetration we could get publicly by not having payment set up. And in the end, what it becomes is exhaustion. Um, <laughs> when Emily... When, I, when, when Emily came on board with me, which I asked her to do, I invited her to be part of this. And that was a partnership that was pretty much predicated on trust and the sense that both of us shared a vision about what we wanted to do. And that over the last year has borne a lot of fruit. Um, Emily's had her battles. She's had her critics. She's had people that have... Um, not like the changes that have been made, but ultimately this show isn't about what a few people think. This show is about what we can do in, ter in terms of communicating what we consider to be some of the most important concepts related to the state of humanity at this present time. And I couldn't do this work alone anymore. I don't want to do it alone anymore. And I also don't want to be constantly exhausted trying to keep up a production schedule. So if for me, this was a choice to have somebody who helped, somebody who brought new ideas, a fresh sense of purpose, a fresh and renewed vigor, which as you all know, she has, Emily has a ton of energy <laughs> and she has brought that energy to the platform. She's brought it to her work and she's done it with admirable fashion. So as we move forward, the commitment to the public is largely this. Where and when we feel material is critical, we will not hold back. We will put things out occasionally that are just the full-blown shows if we feel they're important and we think that we serve the best interest of everybody, including the people that support us. And I believe the people that support us are in line with us on that. Yeah, and the other thing is, one of the other benefits, and this was also something we considered, and actually as much of, as, as much of a motivating purpose for why we're doing what we're doing, is there's also some content that we cover. There are certain topics Sensitive. that we cover that we cover in a deeper nature than there really is it's anyone personal. else out there covering. Yeah. And we want some of the people to be able to feel, I can think of a number of people already that may feel com like they're able to come forward and share their story when they know that the personal part of the story may be behind a wall yeah. where we know yeah. who's listening. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so for that reason, and also there's certain ideas that Randy and I have been talking about in the background that have not really been talked about in the alternative media um, that we would like to start playing with talking about some of them, yeah. but some of them are sensitive and some of them also could invite censorship, could invite uh, other kinds of things. And we, it's one of those things that when you know that when you have a closed group, that you know that the information is going around in it, you can feel a lot more secure about, you know, if there's an, if there's an issue, we know, we know who has the information. So. And I, and I understand that the people who are watching this on the open platforms like YouTube, Probably right now we're going, so is this like a sell job? And it's not. Mm -mm. You know, the people who cannot afford to pay, who for whatever reason cannot, do not, our devotion is still to put the information out. You're in, we invite you to join us in whatever way you can. Yeah. But at the same time, there are people who make this possible. There have been people that have been supporting me for years. And I felt very strongly that this is not selling anybody anything. The deal is largely this. The patrons are the people that make it happen. They do so much like the old patron system that existed in, in, in the Middle Ages and the period of the Renaissance, which was basically the aristocracy of that time, the money class, supported the artist class to create, which then filtered out into the larger public domains. You would not have Rembrandt. You would not have yeah. Shakespeare. You would not have all of Michelangelo, all of the marvelous art and inventions and writers without the people in that time. And you can call them elites if you want to, but they made an explosion of knowledge and, and art and music possible to generations long after them. So we'd like to think that the people who join us or the people who did the buy-in 
who have the ability to do this and make it possible for everybody else to receive the content. Yes. So it's not a sell job. We love you even if you don't support us, we yeah. always have. Yeah, and there's a lot of people who can't, that can't yeah. support financially that yeah. they support by liking, sharing, all that kind of stuff. Exactly, there's a lot of ways that this works yeah. in paying, and paying paying forward. And the other thing, and this is another reason why I'm looking forward to us eventually moving it over to our own platform because this part of it is not available on Patreon. There may be some people out there who can't afford stuff but can offer to help us with some things exactly. that, we could, that when we are on our own yeah. platform. We'll That's important. To, we'll be able to offer a sort of scholarships and that or whatever, or, or just trades in terms yeah. of they'll have a subscription and they will help us with some aspects of promotion or they'll transcribe the shows for us or something like that. And we, Patreon doesn't have a feature for that. When we move to our own site, we'll be able to offer that. And so we're not, and, and also by any means, if there's ever a survivor out there who hears the first part of the show, you know, or, or someone who something topic really speaks to personally, who hears the first part of the show and cannot afford to be a member, but feels that there might be something in that, that they yeah. think is coming in that second hour that's important to them, please contact us and we'll work with you to make, we'll make it possible. Make, make it possible. Yeah, we're sort of yeah. hamstrung by the platforms we're using right now, which is Patreon and PayPal. There's nothing wrong with Patreon. It serves the purpose that it was designed for. We don't have the ability to bypass our own system. So in <laughs> a sense, we're kind of hamstrung in that we can't say to you, oh, here, we'll comp you a month's membership. Yeah. Please feel free to come in and partake, which is something we would do yeah. on our own site because we feel like opening the doors to this in a way. That, so l let me talk about money for a minute. and Let me talk about where this is going because this actually pivots into some of the, some of the big stories this year related to money, including the cryptocurrencies. We have to get a different mindset about finances. We have to redesign the world's financial system. And you begin designing the world's financial system by reconfiguring your own. And some of that has to do with, let us just say, positioning yourself in acceptance of the universe to offer you things that you can't see right now. You know, you know I come from a background of scripture and while I don't practice Christianity and I don't consider myself religious, I've always been kind of touched by some of the verses in there. And one of them is that faith is the substance of things unseen, the evidence of things you have not yet manifested. That's sort of a crude paraphrase of it. But there's a truth there. There's a truth in all the mystical traditions about manifestation and the fact that as humans, we're so broken down that we've been slaves for so long that we actually think that capitalism and socialism were, were, were products of, of liberating human beings when they were the opposite. It was enslavement. And same I with warn democracy. You, same with democracy. A democracy, the same thing. <laughs> Republic, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, and I warn you now that the next system's trap is being set now. Right now. If you're not careful. Does that mean you should not go into cryptos? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is wherever you put your faith, wherever you put your energy, that's going to be where you harvest from. And if you limit that system, if you invest in a limited system, you're going to have a limited return, but the universe is unlimited. So we have to, we have to reconfigure this for ourselves. And we have to understand that an exchange of energy, whether it's demarcated in dollars or whether it is barter in kind, or whatever exchange of value it is, we can work with it and we can define what the system is for us. And so this isn't about making money. This isn't about doing a sell job. This is about beginning as a small community to redefine economics on our own terms instead of letting the cabal, the elites, and the Illuminati define our economic systems for us. Yeah. Yeah, and also, and also, yeah. And also about... People, us being able to focus more of our time and energy on this um, yeah. and being able to, you know, we want, we, I mean, I think we do a great job for how, for how busy both of us are and our time yeah. constraints and whatever. But, you know, sometimes when we have our like conversations where we're just like, you know, goal setting or, or shooting ideas around, we have some really cool phenomenal yeah. ideas that we'd love to be able to bring to you and just you know that having a little bit more time makes that and make here it. again this is this is visioning um 
th imagine what the world would be like if everybody on this realm, notice I'm not using the word world or earth or globe. Or plane or, or, or and, and, and <laughs> We're throwing all that terminology out this year. But imagine that everyone in this realm, every vibrant, living, soul-breathed human being was actually doing what they love yep. and what they were sent here to do. If everybody, I mean, we should be doing things that we enjoy doing and that we're good at and that we can, because when we do that, we are of the most benefit to both ourselves and to those around us. Yeah. You know, there's no reason why somebody who's good at something should be doing something they're miserable at and suck at while someone else is doing something they're, you know what I mean? Like we should all, you know, it, it, the true sort of synchronicity and order will come when we all get to spend our time. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work hard, that everything's perfect all the time and that we don't ever have to do anything we don't want, but it is silly to waste you our know, time. It's funny though, I presented that concept to somebody one day and they sat there and they listened to me do that whole spiel and they went, well, who wants to haul garbage? And I went, no, no, wait a minute. You need to look at this differently. That's a really important job. Mm -hmm. The problem is we relegated that to something that was deemed to be below human dignity. Right. And there is no work that's below human dignity. And there is no work that will go undone when rewards are properly set yeah. for such I work. Mean, there are some people. There are who poets who will haul garbage for the sake of being able to put in a day's work with great wages while they're composing in their head. There are geniuses that will do this kind of work because in the interim, it's how they pay the bills. Yeah. That's an organic economic system. That's really what we're visioning. When somebody has a job that's really hard, they need to be paid for a job that's They really do, hard. yeah. When and if it's has... demeaning work, it needs to be, rec it needs to be recompensed yeah. even higher. Yeah. You know, we don't pay well the people who take care of our elderly, the people who nurse Teachers, our sick, the people yeah, who yeah. take care of our children. Yep. That's how we wound up with a bunch of fucking pedophiles looking after our kids. Yep. So, I mean, and even like I, at this point, I'd even say it's really important to have a trustworthy person as your garbage man, so absolutely. you know they're not selling your garbage. That's to the right. And shit yeah, like that, that so, happened to Bob Dylan once. You know, have a you know, <laughs> yeah, like the people who service our houses, our our cleaning people, our garbage people, our mailman, whatever. Like you, we want good good people doing those positions. Yeah, not, get a good shredder too. You get a good shredder, yeah. <laughs> so or some nasty that's, stuff all over your garbage. That's so kind of the philosophical. <laughs> that's kind of the philosophical grounds that we're working from, and and hopefully, you know, whether you're a member of our Patreon group or whether you support us or whether you're watching on YouTube and you think we're just trying to sell you something, we're not. We we are going to continue to get the shows. We're going to give you the best we have to offer you, but we had to make some choices here, and so those are yeah. the choices we're making going forward in 2018. Come and join us if you can. Please join us. And, yeah. and, and yeah, so, yeah, so, all right. So now that we've taken care of that stuff. And also, guys, just real quickly for one, big hand of applause for Randy, who did this for nearly 10 years. For really, I mean, he had a few people who would support him here and there. But he did this as a passion project for all of this time. I mean, I appreciated it. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys about this stuff if it weren't for him doing the shows that he did and, and me finding a place that felt like home and whatnot. So um, thank you, Randy, for the service that you've done for our community for a really long time. Thanks. Yeah. I'm almost going to cry. <laughs> Very embarrassed right now. <laughs> anyway, okay, so go, uh, let's, let's get into what this year was like. I mean, in 2017, this one was pretty crazy. Um, yeah, it was. Very you know, crazy. so I don't know. We had some really interesting shows this year. We, we, like, it seems like 20 years this year like when I look back at like I was just going through and looking at the whole list of the, our shows from this year and like where we started at and like I, I think our first show of the year was um let's see what was the first show of the year the first show of the year looks like it was uh maybe one of your with Shmuel Asher and then, and okay, then, yeah. yeah, and then with Kara St. Louis on the so Sovereign Imagination, and we've done s several things with Kara this year. I've, I, you know, um, I think back when I first, when Kara first met me like a year and a half ago, she was a little unsure, a little unsure about me, but she and I have managed to sort through that and, and have had done some interesting stuff this year. And then we had some shows with Og Talez 
and we had the show where we set our kind of intentions for this year, which we've accomplished. And we had Lisa and Danny. That was an interesting show. We had it took us all year to do it, but we did accomplish it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, Lisa and Danny and mm -hmm. Kristen Cherie. Yeah. And some of these are uh, relationships that have carried on that we're glad we sort of, you know, kind of uh, did stuff with. We had a show with Duncan. You had some more with Samuel Asher and Dana. And then we had Crow. And we had several shows, obviously, this year with Robert Phoenix. Man, the shows with Robert Phoenix are always some of my favorites. I really love Robert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Robert's part of the family. There, Robert is part you of know, our family. There, there are people who will pop up here, Kara's like that. Um, yeah. People that you've seen for years on the show. There's kind of a doormat that sits out that says, you're welcome anytime, call us, talk to us. To yeah. bring you on because that's kind of what this is. And in a lot of ways, what we are is we're, we're not only bringing you other presenters and information people and researchers, but we're reaching out to the alternative media that we think is the real alternative media as opposed to the faux alternative right. media, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So Robert is part of the Off Planet Radio family and, and we'll, we have him here. He'll be the first show next year. And, um, you know, we love, we'll, we always want to do any things we can with Robert. Yeah. Um, re real quickly, I just want to back up because I do want to say something. You know, there was a few shows and some personal videos that I did with Aug Telez earlier in the year. And, you know, things kind of, you know, we've kind of parted ways in terms of, you know, things got a little kind of haywire yeah, they there. Did. They did. Um, you know, like, but I, I will say this. Um, I, I, I think, I think, Aug, I do think Aug is a, a person searching for himself and is a, is a good person. And he did bring in whatever convoluted and confusing meth manner forward some ideas that had some sort of concepts and ideas that had really important, a really important concept. Yeah, really important it's, concepts and ideas and certain yeah. ways of thinking about things that, like, unfortunately, for a lot of people, were lost in sometimes his inability to articulate it clearly. Um, and I will say this: that is a state. That is a stage of this, a stage of of deprogramming, a stage it of is. figuring out who you are. And so, um, just I don't know that most people understand that. The act of coming forward at any level, and you and I both know this, of coming forward and bringing experiences that are both as diverse and as convoluted as black ops programs, government mind control, my labs, whatever all that is, places you in a very precarious position. Mm -hmm. And to Og's credit, he did pretty much what I did in terms of going out on his own, lone wolfing it, and, and pushing forward an, a, a pretty big piece of information. Yeah, and and he put out a lot. I mean, if you go look at like, his stuff, blogs yeah. and stuff, yeah. you know, there's a lot of confu confu like uh, Sometimes it's hard to get through it all. If, you, if we could distill it down to some more concise ideas, there's still a yeah. lot there. And he was the first person to start to actually say in words, even though it took him a lot of them, some of the things that I knew in my own mind but hadn't really yeah. been able to figure out yeah. a way to talk about. So by him being, not being afraid to make a mess of it a little bit, it, it actually helped me to crystallize it and be able to finally say some of the things that I couldn't say before. Yeah. And um, yeah. I just want, if Aug is hearing us, I want to know that Randy and I both actually- We, we love you, man. We love we you do. all, yes. care for you. And um, I wish him nothing but, but health, well-being, and self-knowledge, and, and joy and happiness, um, and I'm sure we'll have conversations again. You know what I mean? Like, I, these things circle back when it's time they to do. circle back. Yeah, this yeah. is uh, quite, quite simply, the most credible of us is capable of being compromised, and the most solid of us can be collapsed yeah. very easily by the, by the control structure. Yeah, you uh, know what I mean? I, I've yeah. gone through... I've gone through periods of time when I've been heavily hit energetically with uh, what, I'll, what I call energy weapons that have been aimed at me. I've, I've hit huge banks of mind control that have put me into endless loops. There have been yep. times when I've wanted to quit. There's people that I've pissed off, some justifiably so, and there are people that I love 
that right now there's a breach and all of these things get corrected over time. When we yeah. finally reach the point where we clear a lot of the dark energy, a lot of these things are not factors anymore. So we soldier on yeah. and you know, you people, the, the people out there who we're close to, even if we're kind of estranged right now, we still love you and we still thoughts. respect you and we're still here. <laughs> You're in yeah. our thoughts. We think yeah. of you and we respect you for, for the contributions that Absolutely. you've made, both to the entire community and to our personal journeys. Um, and so I just wanted to say that about Aug and I hope he's doing well. And uh, so, yeah, I noticed you mentioned Shamil. Shamil we got to get yeah. back in touch with Shamil. Yeah. <clears throat> that requires a fair amount of uh, production to do Shamil's show, mainly because he's in a remote location that has bare minimum internet and almost bare minimum telephone communication so doing those shows with shamil asher requires that the timing line up my schedule line up this year has not been that year so far but he'll be back we love shamil yeah. we like yeah. what he brings to the table I'm, um, I'm waiting for my chance to have a crack at shamil yeah. too, because I think and we'll we get have... that we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get all that going next year again um, for sure yeah so then Okay, so then I'm just kind of going through and looking just to kind of do a little review here. I had that show that, that really interesting show with Sophia Smallstorm, which is the first time yeah, she died, yeah. that was about CrossFit cults, that there's been lots of things that came up in that show that have come up again uh, related to other things later. So that's a show that I keep looking back on and going, God, we hit on some really interesting points. And um, I'm glad to have gotten to know Sophia this year. We got to do a couple of shows and she and I have also been able to have some personal conversations mm -hmm. and she is a fascinating character and, um, you know, you know, we've only done a few shows with her, but I, we sort of consider part of the, we, we like Sophia and we'll have her back many times, I'm sure. Um, and she is a fascinating mind and is a huge, you know, huge sort of inspiration to me to not be afraid to be like a radically free thinker. Um, and so that's so cool that, you know, that I got to make that really neat show with her and yeah. And then we had, um, the gymnastics and the pedo gate, the overshow, right? The, right. And the USA Gymnastics, which continues to, the pedophilia and the gymnastics continues to be a topic. Um, I mentioned before that Jenny Moonstone and I tried to record a show about this and got all sorts of interference. We will revisit that. She and I have both uh, had kind of tight schedules. Um, so we will revisit that because we think it is important and we've kind of come to an understanding of what we were talking about that may have been controversial. So guess what? We're going to talk about it some more. <laughs> That's how we do it. Um, and then was the Cynthia McKinney show, man. Remember the set? That, can you believe oh, it was that, that was, long ago? So that was, was already it, yeah. eight months ago. Um, and that was a really cool, I loved that show because that's like something I could share with my family and friends who aren't into all this stuff and they got it and they thought it was cool and what a neat person she is. And, um, you know, like we, I'm sure we'll have her back sometime. Like I was a little confused by the whole stuff with uh, David, Robert David, Robert David Steele. Steele yeah. But I, yeah, she seems to have pulled back a little from that and, um, she's just a special person, and I was super glad that we got to do that that show with her. And um, yeah, that was really cool. What did you think about that? That was fun, wasn't it? And I was asking you kind of what you thought about that because I thought that was a really neat show, and I loved. Well, being... it was cool to watch her because I remember her being on the national stage. Yeah. Obviously, you know, a maverick, a firebrand, somebody that was not cut out of the same cloth as either the opposition or own party. You know, somebody that fought for themselves. Yeah. And that image of her grilling Dick Cheney. Is Donald Rumsfeld. Donald, Donald Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld. Yeah. Donald Rumsfeld, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see her grill Dick Cheney. I would like to. <laughs> well, I'd like to grill Dick Cheney personally myself. I got. Yeah. I just, you know, I think this is, you know, she still, she is like my father. She still valiantly believes in the system and in government. And, and I, you know, so I, I think she comes at that from an earnest and honest place. So I totally respect that. But, to me, she is the prime example of is if government were meant to help people, it would be full of people like her, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that she was the lone person out there and then they made her life miserable and she had to go to Bangladesh to get a job. Like that pretty much explains to you that the government is not your friend. Um, so that was cool. And I still, she, you know, she gave, she put me, she gave me uh, her son's email address because he, he's into like, um, uh, de-dollarizing social interactions and urban farming and stuff like that. So one of the side shows we have that we're working on for this year, when we get that going, I will still offer, uh, I will still extend an invitation to Coy McKinney because I think that would be really cool to talk to him. Um, so then the next place we got to was, um, 
Well, we, we, hit, we had another show with Sean Gatro and with Jim Kerr, and that was really interesting. And, um, and we'll have Sean back soon. He always has interesting things. But again, before we even get into the kind of next place we got, the next topic, you know, in my mind, to the, to the extent that there is a secret space program, Sean is the king daddy of who has the evidence of it. And still... Nobody other than us at Off Planet Radio and a few others are talking to him. And so uh, until, until something happens in that arena, I honestly question the motives of people who are interested in the things that go on above our head. Okay, you know? so now you mentioned the secret space program. Right. And um, first that was the next off, place. Say, yeah, and, you know, the thing about it, Sean Gutro. Uh, Sean Gutro is probably one of the most sequestered, buried people out there in alternative media in terms of what he presents. It is so far afield that the people who are far afield can't really countenance what Sean's doing. And so Sean's, Sean's like, he's like Robert Phoenix. He's, he's part of us. He's part of what we're doing. Yeah. There is an agenda here. People need to understand this. We have an agenda. There are things we're bringing out mm -hmm. that yeah. fly in the face of the consensus narrative, even in the alternative media. So uh, I don't know how far forward we've wound in our timeline, but if we get to April tangentially here, uh, April 14th, somewhere in around there, you sent me an email mm -hmm. with the poster for Contact in the Desert featuring Corey Good standing with uh, spray-on bronze tanning in a blue uniform as, a, as, the <laughs> featured, as the featured speaker at Contact in the Desert. And it had a list of about a bunch of other names. And when I looked at the combination mm -hmm. of it, my question to Randy in the email was, I can't, or what I said was, I can't imagine the kind of Tom fuckery, bullshittery, energy harvesting, mind control programming that's going to go on at this event. And that but we could, because before that, we, did we had imagine. already talked about this. We, already talked. we had Elisa Elon. The year before. In, in, yeah. the course, in the course of doing that interview, out of, you know, pretty much nowhere, she rolled out this story about being at the... Um, UFO uh, conference in, in, in Nevada somewhere. Nevada, yeah. Yeah, Laughlin or something like that. The crash retrieval conference at Laughlin, Nevada. Yeah. And the fact that she was abducted while she was there and subjected to some very nasty things. Yeah. Which led us to then, and then this video has been posted standalone, issue the warning... Issue the warning. ...about specifically UFO and paranormal conferences oh. and the opportunities they presented. We issued, we, be, we, issued we, we cut that piece from the prior interview from last it, yeah. year and we run that. And then we, a few weeks after that, we had her back for that t episode that we titled Mind War PSYOPs were on Worldview Warfare yeah. and conferences. And that episode with Elisa was extremely powerful and we did manage to get it out before contact in the desert happened. And so hopefully maybe if there was, yeah, we do know that there was a lot of weird things going on there. But Everything that we expected to happen actually did happen. Except for they didn't land any UFOs and take anyone into space. At least not that we know of yet. Right, but, yeah, well, you know, that wasn't going to be Maybe we saved that off. But um, we, so we did, I think that both the shows we've done with Elisa and hopefully there'll be more in the future have been really, really powerful. But I think that was a really important show. And that um, started a chain reaction that we are still <laughs> still sort of experiencing. It's kind of died off a little bit, at least for us, because they weren't really, it, when it, it, as it turns out, most people weren't really too interested in hearing from us about, for, from us about it, even though we were the ones who pointed it out and it's moved on to other uh, people talking yeah, about it. Yeah. But, um, you know, rant, the, the post, so in between the and time- And having said all that, I went to two conferences this year. Yeah. Um, the second conference, which I was, which I was, I was a, technically a presenter at the uh, at the Paracon in Houston. Turned out to be beyond trippy. Um, mm -hmm. We were basically abducted by an Uber driver and driven around. <laughs> Not driven by around Uber guys. Outbacks, abducted by an Uber driver. Driven around the outbacks of Houston for over six hours against our wishes. And huge energetic harvesting went on at that conference. There was a lot of, it was a great conference. 
it was for me kind of the cautionary tale to pay attention to your own information because you really aren't in control of your environment at times. And that was kind of the important lesson of that. So <clears throat> we go from Elisa E and the warning about conferences. So, so go ahead, jump in. Yeah, hold on. So I just want to make sure, because we make sure we get this historically accurate here. In the time between when we put out the warning video and we had Elisa on, Randy made that post that went ultra viral on Facebook where he basically called out this whole Corey Good, Blue Avian, Blue Sphere Alliance, Contact in the Desert thing that started, I mean, like that went so viral. It had so many comments and started so much drama, yeah. but it, 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 it became annoying at a certain point, but it actually needed to happen. And, you know, it led to the whole thing with Bill Ryan and the dark journalist and, 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 there's been further and further stories of coming out, which some of them we're still hearing about from people like Yvonne Palermo of things that have gone on with this, with this, I don't even know what to fucking call it. Uh, consortium of, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't even have a name for what this mess is. Um, it, well, what this mess it, is. It, it, it fucked up Cliff's work. It fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so <laughs> let's, let's get a little clarity on what this mess is. This mess has been around in the entire history of ufology, it's called the aviary. And it is a yeah. very controlled group of inside government officials, military people, various defense contractor types. And it involves Project Bluebird. Prefabricated media figures like David Wilcock. Yeah. And, and, and then prefabricate figures like Corey Good with prefabricated narratives like the secret space program which as you and i have stated the secret of the secret space program there is no space as a program understand space yeah. now is there space well yeah but it is our standing that you're not getting to space with rockets and you're not going up to go out because in order to get out you've got to go through another layer of something we know here as water. You gotta go, the only way out is in. Our Sorry. bodies our bodies are made up of mostly water and we're dealing up with the situation of yep. the oceans above and the oceans below and all of that kind of, you know, so the this, this space is not what we think it is. There are multiple programs and it's just as much about the space inside of us as it is about yeah. the space out there. And, you know, we've said this many times um, and um, to me it is, I mean, I, this is a little bit really more Randy's wheelhouse. Like I notice these things, but um, for me, like I've always been a little like the, you know, a little weird about the stuff with the UFOs and the aliens and whatever. Cause it always felt to me like there was so much manipulation around it and programming around it. And I always just got kind of a, that I don't go, that I don't get too involved in that kind of thing feeling. Um, but uh, there's, it's unbelievable to me the 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 how many people are buying into this nonsense with Corey Good? It's unbelievable to me the lack of discernment um, that some people have shown, and also I have tremendous respect for the bravery of those people who admit that they showed a lack of discernment, discernment and have come forward with their stories about some of this kind of stuff. It's really hard to do, um, but you know like. We are, and this leads me to something else I want to talk about. None of us are perfect. And we all, I had something happen to me this year that showed a shocking lack of discernment on my behalf, on my behalf. And fortunately I was able to come through it you know, without too much permanent, <laughs> too much permanent damage. And um, I accept complete responsibility for that. But some we, guys, we need to start making, you know, sometimes I know some of this stuff, can, you know, it sounds good and it's fun and I'm not, not so much speaking to our audience because I think our audience are, are pretty, pretty sophisticated. Um, but we all, even within our sophisticated group, um, you know, sometimes we, we, we let our discernment down for a minute because something is fun or something is interesting or something is cool or some, we just get tired of having to be vigilant about everything all the time. And so we really, one of the huge lessons for me this year and maybe for other people as well, I don't know, is that, really have to listen to our intuition even when it's telling us the exact opposite of what we want it to be telling us <laughs> you know and um yeah like i don't you know there's some people out there that 
I really like amazing researchers and have so much good knowledge and then also the bluebirds thing and i don't understand it <laughs> you know what i mean well there you know within the U, within the realm of ufos this has really been difficult because the government has been in control of information about ufos and specifically about what have been termed et's off world beings advanced civilizations advanced technology for over 70 years there is a truth in all this. Yep. There are also a nest of lies, pun intended. It's, it's a nest full of bluebirds, by the way, blue chickens. But <laughs> there is a nest of lies that have been planted into the culture about UFOs and extraterrestrials. And you're not going to be able to parse this information because you don't understand. So, okay. So the thrust of what we're really doing right now is to deconstruct and then rebuild the narrative from a better position of knowledge, intuition, and right thinking. If you've gone through the flat earth thing, which obviously was not, a, flat earth is not, had, didn't go away in 2017, but it was basically reduced to a level of being, I guess you would call it a novelty. Nevertheless, the effect of the flat earth thing, which raged from 2015, well, it's 2015. Still it's still raging. It's, it's still, still raging, yeah. It's just that we don't engage it because it's not necessary at this point. Yeah. It's, in some ways, flat earth served a very good purpose. Because it's a great it created, exercise. Yeah. It created an exercise in mental stimulation <laughs> of questioning and challenging our physical construction of our world. And also just how, yeah. how easily we accept things that are just like, you know, there's no discussion about the shape of the earth in, in kindergarten. There's just a globe there and no conversation about it. And so if they can get you to, you know, never ask questions about stuff, they got you. So for that purpose, I, you know, it, it, yeah, it was a fun, it was a good exercise. The assumptions have been made about the construct of the, of, of the world and the universe and the galaxy and all of that based on mathematical models that are nearly 500 years old, that were made at a time when we frankly really didn't even have very good telescopes. And quite honestly, we were dealing then with the Vatican siloing most of the scientific information of the world and then retrofitting it to meet whatever their theological models were. Yeah. So Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, going forward to Einstein, and even into the mid to late 20th century quantum phys physics, were all based on assumptions of models that could only be arrived at mathematically, meaning that they had to be put into formula and they had to be concretized with numbers. And the flaw in that is largely that we never really went back and re-examined the models that we based the later models upon. So as I posted on Facebook the other day, in terms of science right now, we're still playing catch up ball because we haven't challenged the, the dominant narrative of science itself. And you don't need to be a physicist to do that sports fans, you really don't. Some of this is observational and some of it is intuitive. And if it feels like you're being fed bullshit, you're probably being fed bullshit. Whether it's by, whether it's by, um, uh, name, who's, who's that? Neil the, the, deGrasse Tyson. In the, no, Gra Neil deGrasse Tyson. Michio Kaku. Or, Michio Kaku. Or Corey Good. Yeah. You see, they're all based on the same models and they're all and based on the same lies. And I bet you there's some similar code on their, some of their paychecks too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. the whole blue chicken cult thing really blew up over the summer. It raged for months on Facebook. It created a lot of division. I made a lot of friends and a lot of enemies. Um, I have to say, in some ways, it was very good for us. And in mm -hmm. some ways, it was horrible because I sat up a lot of nights reviewing people's challenges to my comments about Corey Good basically being a cult leader only to find a few months later that even some of those people defected and then came over to our side to the point where we were talking to people inside of Corey Good's organization. So 
the takeaway from the Corey Good thing, because I will tell you now, even though he's still running on cosmic disclosure, and even though he's still milking this, Corey Good is a spent force at this point. Yeah, they've moved on to Tom DeLong, and and now this. And that list, was always the goal. That was always the plan because Tom yes. DeLong has a higher profile. You know, they they kind of practiced it. Well, they beta tests. They this beta is a, tested it. And then it's Tom DeLong, and now it's this thing that came out. It's been coming out in the mainstream media the last few weeks about the uh, aerial threats and whatever. And then, of course, another SpaceX launch with Elon Musk. All, Elon Musk was the whole thing. Like we're getting into. There's going to be sp- all, all like 24-hour day space nonsense all the time going forward. And you know, the, the, there's just different levels of the tests and experiments and yeah. trials to see who will buy what, who will believe what, how much can we say is this when it's really that. Um, did you, if anybody, if you want to just see like. A shockingly, like, I don't even know what to say about it. Go watch the Joe Rogan podcast with Tom DeLong. Joe Rogan could not stand him. Like, yeah. he, Tom DeLong made such a, such a complete horse's ass of himself. He almost made Corey Good look good. You know what I mean? Like, he made, it was really bad. Well, and, you know, you have two very similar types of personality. Yeah. And Corey Good and Tom DeLong are both very similar personalities. Not, they come actually, from the same look, era. They, they kind of look alike. They kind of look alike. Yeah. And, and, and you have to understand, none of this is by accident. Mm-mm. Again, I remind you, the, a, the aviary, Project Bluebird, yep, the, Project Bluebird the, guys. Uh, Majestic oh. 12, all of these were programs designed to take ufology in whatever direction it fit the objections, the objectives of the the controlling elite at the time. Now, isn't it interesting how fast it flipped as DeLonge is launching and Corey Good is sort of fading back a little bit. All of a sudden, the end of November, the beginning of December and running up until even the last couple of weeks, we've been getting big hits in major media, again, indicating, oh yes, the Pentagon is actually talking now. They had a program. Harry oh, Reid yeah. Harry Reid is offering disclosure. <laughs> but remember that Hillary Clinton was also courting the UFO Podesta, crowd. John Podesta. John Podesta. Yeah. Which which is which connects to a very interesting group of people. Again, this is the aviary, and this is yeah. the game that, that they've been playing for 70 years now yeah. of basically leading you by the nose. Oh, there's disclosure, there's no disclosure. You know, tinfoil hatters, UFO people. I don't even want this. Like, if this closure came, who the fuck would even believe it at this point? Well, like, disclosure it's itself. Confirmation or whatever, like you said. I've call, I'm now calling it faux fo- fo- closure. Yeah. That's F A U X closure. Yeah. Because what you're getting now is faux closure. There is no disclosure. And yet, the very people inside of this controlled group, David Wilcock is now promoting Tom DeLonge <laughs> heavily. David Wilcock is saying, oh, this is the tip of the iceberg. Now we're getting disclosure. And I predicted this 10 years ago because we all know. How you know that they're full of shit is half of the things uh, David Wilcock says will tell you why you can't trust the government. Yet we're going to ask them for disclosure and we're going to believe them. The whole thing makes just no fucking sense, guys. No. Like if you you got you guys your own the only disclosure you need is your own experiences your own intuition that's, right. that's disclosure. So we had a, you had a series we had a series of shows sort of going through this with people with Christine and Shane and Alfred and, yeah. and whatever uh, and those were all interesting and then we had an interesting episode with with Seth Sethicus Boza who I, I I really like I like Seth sometimes yeah sometimes I struggle listening to some of his stuff because he doesn't just speak in regular plain English. He has like all this other terminology for things that sometimes I don't know what he's talking about, but I really like Seth anyway. <laughs> and I think he's a good guy. And then Seth is Seth. Seth actually is uh, kind of the new shaman. Yeah. Along with Rock I, th- I think they're very similar in the way they approach their mysticism yeah. and the necessity for us to plug into this. Yeah. And you're going to see more of this. Yeah. Because in the coming year, people are going to begin to go inside. And here again, we are our own navigators, but we are also co navigators with each other. And the gifts of the mystic and the shaman are things we need in order to get to the place that we're going sure. collectively and individually. Healers, shaman, 
practitioners, herbalists, yep. alchemists like our friend Dawn. Yep. Um, these, are, these are important figures at the forefront of pushing humanity to where we need to go now. You haven't talked to Seth in a while, so shout out to you, Seth. I guess shout out, Seth. Seth. We'll be yeah. talking soon. We both, we're both, uh, we both really appreciate you. And then, you know, we had this post -trauma, trauma show with Duncan after Duncan had his incident yep. early in the summer. And, um, you know, that was awful. Uh, we're so glad that Duncan is okay because he's an important yeah. part of, of, of this community. And, and, um, yeah, so we're, we're glad that that went yeah. the way, not another way. Duncan, we miss you. We love you. We miss you and love you, yes. And then we had some, um, some like disclaiming, disclaimer show because we had been uncomfortable with, though, though we both like him as a person, we had been uncomfortable with some of the topics of, with Alfred, Alfred Lemmermont Weber. And then we knew that uh, we, we had the show coming up with Andrew Bashago because we had already recorded yeah. it. And that was a really big show. It was cut into two parts. and. Um, both of us have, I'll speak for myself. I have tremendous respect for Andrew Bishago, though, though I have a different perception. I think he's telling the truth 100%, but I have a different perception of what he thinks his experiences were than, than how yeah. he does. And, and so our little uh, dis, dis, our, um, disclaimer show was basically to say that, look, we, some of the information that gets presented here on Off Planet is presented is because we think these people's stories are important and that there's important data points and truths within them, but that we don't necessarily agree with everything our guests say, you know, so. Well, I think it's important to say that we want to present information from perspectives that may vary from our own. Yeah. The only thing that excludes that is where we think there is disinformation, misinformation, or where somebody is operating under in undue influence. Yeah. Having said that, we understand that nearly everybody in our circle has a certain level of influence exerted upon them because of past issues, and even in some cases present. Present issues so, and, future, and future issues. <laughs> and future issues. Look, yeah. you know, they've been screwing with people for a long time. They're going to continue to screw with people as long as they have any power at all. Yeah. Now, we have to disempower them very slowly. This is a slow dis deconstruction. This will not be a revolution with flags planted at the top yeah. of hills. Yeah, and, and there's, part, there's parts of Andrew, particularly Andrew's story, that are very important. And that was really interesting for me to finally get to meet him and talk to him because we come from the same town. And yeah. there are so many similarities between like, some of our data, the data points and some of our experience, just the way we perceive them is different. But I, he was really, really nice. Well, and let me point out to people that wanted to lump and, Andy with um, Corey. Corey Good, because unfortunately that happened at MUFON in Las Vegas the secret space program presentation, Andy was placed in an unenviable position of having to side with Corey Good as Rich Dolan played pitball with everybody else on the panel, basically challenging them to put up a shut up. While Rich Dolan himself, Rich, we've met, we've talked, I admire your early work, but dude, you have two sets of standards and you're not living by them. So the thing about it is that Andy was in the unenviable position of having to side with Corey Good in order to maintain his own narrative integrity. Having said that, and I told Andy this in a private conversation, you were not served well by being in Vegas. Having said that, Andy Bishago has never received any, any compensation at all for what he has done. He has been out there for years now talking. And... Andy has offered as much information in ways that I think are true to his story without ever compromising himself. I cannot say the same thing about Mr. Good and Mr. Wilcock, who sold themselves to Gaia TV, which is run by a coven. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. So, yeah. I mean, so that I, kind of maybe that puts the underscores and exclamation points in a proper place in reference to the Blue Chicken yeah. cult and what's going on with the insurgency and the, the, the secret space program, secret space program when, when and people, ufology. When people come forward with important truth and, and, and yeah, with important truth, they're, they're not usually rewarded for it 
with a television show and at $200,000 a year salary, they're usually ridiculed, made fun of and marginalized like Andy has been. And so my hat's off to Andy for continuing to, you know, stick with his guns and whatever. And, you know, maybe he's a little naive with some things and I don't think he's ever going to get the validation or from his peers or from whatever that he's looking for. Um, But you have the respect of people who understand, who, who, who know sort of what it is you're really doing. Um, Andy, Andy, thanks for coming on. Thanks yeah. for doing what you do. And you're another one of those people that we say we deeply love and respect what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we had some over the summer, there was, you know, we had the show with Ileana. We had a, another show with Derek Rose. That was super cool when I got to um, go meet Derek Rose at his event. Um, you know, he's a little different than us. He kind of is, you know, really focused on just the sort of decentralization and anarchy and whatever. But um, I'll have him back again and again. I, I really like him. And I think what he's doing, there are parts of what he's doing that are really important for us to incorporate into the kind of community we're building. My ha- Much respect to Derek Bros. He's a lovely person. When I met him in person, he was uh, exactly the way he seems. There's no, no weird stuff or anything like that. The people that all showed up at his event were very nice. Um, I, Danny Katz went with me. We had a nice time and um, hats off to Derek for uh, stick, you know, just completely yes. dedicating his life to what he's doing. Speaking of lovely people, uh, somewhere in the equation here is Mark Devlin. Um, well, Mark, well, Mark Devlin, actually, we, we had him on at the end of last end year. End of last year. And Mark Devlin has his new book coming out. I, yeah. And I'm working it. We're still in the planning phases of it of, on a little event here with him in Los Angeles. And before that happens, we will have him back on the show. His new book is coming out with some contributions by yours truly, which I'm completely like, that's like, I, like, that's like, wow. That's like super cool for someone who influenced me so much that he actually took some of the words from our conversations and that some it was in the book. So I'm totally um, looking forward to having him back, you know, and again, before we do our event and many times in the future. And uh, much, we, we love Mark, much respect to him for the kind of work he yeah. does. Yeah, I got to meet Mark in Philadelphia at Free Your Mind, where I met Sethicus, and I also got to hang out with Mark and Freeman a yeah. little bit. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we, I got to hang with Freeman this year. Yeah, and, and Freeman, Right after the election, as a matter of fact, which, you know, this is not linear because we're never linear. Never. But, uh, <clears throat> so I talked to Freeman right after the election. And, uh, you know, that's probably... Uh, Probably one of the most difficult things for me to talk about right now, and I'm pressed into it constantly. I was pressed into it in a recent interview I did with the Liberty Beacon of dealing with this this juggernaut of Donald Trump and what this represents. And it represents as many different things to as many different people as are out there. Um, I'm not willing to paint with broad strokes with Trump. I think in aggregate, looking at the, at the year. Um, left to his own devices, Trump is extremely toxic and extremely destructive, but Trump is not calling the shots. So in some sense, what Trump's presidency is right now is a deflector shield for the people that in the background are making some changes. Yeah, yeah. and also, since you were talking about Freeman, I also, I, had, I was on a show with Freeman uh, yeah earlier this year. And I want to thank Freeman very much for that. I, uh, I really liked him. I, enjoy, I, you know, when we recorded the show, I thought, God, I don't know if that was my best, uh, my best job there, but when it came out, it was, it was good. And I enjoyed talking to him and um, I got a lot of interaction from people based on uh, talking about some things about Austin and the dance music scene that connected me with some people from back during that time. And mm-hmm. uh, I really, it turned out to be uh, lots of people who hadn't seen me in anything else saw me there and contacted me. And thank you to Freeman. Um, we appreciate your work and you're a nice guy and I enjoyed talking to you. And also I skipped over one of the, one of our big shows, biggest shows of the year was that first show we did. This was going back a few episodes because I accidentally missed it with Cliff High, which I don't know how it, what, is that we it was that you had never spoken to cliff high even before i came around but how we waited so long but that was a great show and it kicked off a a relationship that we're fully enjoying where we get to talk about time and cryptocurrency and 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 i fully enjoy cliff and um i'm so glad that we've gotten to know him and i don't agree with him about everything but there's not the exercise of the mind and the stretching and the imagination and the cool things that come up in the conversations with between the three of us. And when we involve others is so exciting and so fun. Well, you know, isn't it funny that we've now been accused of being 
crypto pimps yeah. for having Cliff on. When in <laughs> fact, what we've been doing, we've actually been challenging the whole the whole crypto narrative this year. I'm the only crypto pimp that doesn't have any crypto. I'm a big pimp. Yeah, big pimp well, pimp. <laughs> actually, I'm, I don't either. I don't either. I, I, uh, I'm sorry to say that I dumped mine long yeah. ago. But um, so the thing about it is, by virtue of having Cliff on and letting him present, we created a narrative that says, okay, this is what we think an honest proponent of Bitcoin and crypto. And Cliff's actually very much into Ethereum, which is, which is a platform. Right. This is what their thinking is. And then doing the show with Danny Katz and bringing Danny on and letting her really work through a lot of even the angst to this whole thing was again, kind of a way to constructively present the information about Bitcoin. Yeah. And yet at the same time, I've expressed with as much vigor as I can muster the fact that I not only am not enthusiastic about it, but I see the dangers specifically in Bitcoin and now even more so in terms of blockchain yeah. and what that yeah. represents. We popped out of order a little bit there. To we did, we did, but that's, but that's me. Okay. I always, I always it, screw so, with time. Well, I'll get back to that. Yes, I'll get back to. I just want to, just for the sake of, of trying to make sure we hit on all the important things. We had that really important show with Robert um, yes. about the eclipse, and the, that was like well, a lot of the craziness that started happening started started happening there. You had the interesting shows with Patty Greer, <laughs> and then we had that show, that interesting show with Rock Estaldo and Lauda Leone. Yeah. And then we had the, another uh, show. You and I did a, one, just the two of us, about the preclips. Yep. And that was interesting. And then we had our Burning Man show, which has been coming up again and again lately because I, I've been t I, I, both on Beyond the Veil and just because some interesting other people are catching on to this idea that I threw out there that Burning Man is Westworld, because it is. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not speaking in metaphor. Burning Man is Westworld. So that was from that we uh, that episode, and then you had your Carbon C60, which people are just catching on to Carbon C60, but Randy, you've been on the Carbon C60. You've known about it and been presenting information about it for years because I tried it four or five years ago after hearing about it on your show. So it's interesting that you were way, way, way ahead of the crowd, and now it's a huge thing. And then we had Danny on and which for her own show, and then again later on with Cliff. And the bringing Danny in was really cool for me. Um, Danny was, a, was, you know, uh, like not, we, we knew each other as children, not necessarily very well, but she was a person I looked up to in gymnastics. And then reacquainting with her over the last year and a half or so has um, actually been really interesting in terms of my own, uh, some of the things that I've figured out about my past. And, and she and I have very interesting conversations. And um, I'm so glad to have her as a friend now, and, and she is a friend of the show, and she will be involved in some things with us going forward. We really like Danny Katz, and so we hope you do too, because there'll be more of her. And I thought she did a, I thought she was extremely brave and did a really incredible job um, with, uh, with Cliff, um, with asking questions that others might have been afraid to ask, and she really did a great job. But that came after our first, that was a little later, our first show with Cliff on time, I thought was classic. You know what I mean? And that, that, that came in the, uh, early fall, and we had our show with Robert Phoenix on the Ritual Americanus. What did you think of some of these shows, Randy? Oh, sorry. I, I, I sort of blooped out there for a minute. So, yeah, um, I was really happy to get Danny Katz on. And Danny and I resonated immediately because both of us have a common cultural touchstone in um, Hunter S. Thompson. Mm-hmm and gonzo journalism and the whole let's reclaim media back to the people so i mean that was good and danny's one of those people she's both a very gentle kind of healer type and at the same time she can be a real hard ass <laughs> and i like that so that was awesome um the, the first show with cliff on time was the next with one cliff on, yeah and and Probably this series on time with Cliff. I don't even think we scratched the surface yet. We have more um, coming next year, guys. Don't worry. This was actually where we started with Og Teles when we did the shows with Og Teles. And, yeah. you know, 
Og understood that there was a commonality between you and I, but also with him and a few other people, yeah. in terms of our mission related to time. Yes. Which for me has been a lifetime pursuit. And myself. And, and yourself as well. And Cliff came, Cliff came along. And asked having, for it. Yeah. And actually having seen what we were doing, felt that this was the platform for him to begin presenting his own thesis um, concepts related to what he's been involved with. And you got to remember, Cliff, Cliff is a software coder, but he's also a person that's practiced um, a specific... Martial arts, meditation, all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. It is very much, in a lot of ways, one of us. Um, yes, he is. And, and, yes. Also, and also an observer. <laughs> an observer. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 So the issues of time come up because time is part of what we're both deconstructing and realigning at the same time. Yeah. So then we had that really cool show with Robert. What well, wasn't really cool? I mean, it was cool. But we, the Ritual Americanus right after the Vegas thing, which we still have almost no answers to what was going on in Vegas. And no. that sort of. That, that was sort of the first event, other than some of this suicide-y stuff that was going on with Cornell and Bennington, and this was the first big event post-Eclipse, and I think started this thing that we're going to be seeing more of, and I would include both the fires in Northern and Southern California to be part of this, this merged reality, this, sorry, split reality with sort of these weird merged events that are getting details from the events in separate realities. Um, you know, I think that literally, I think there was multiple things going on in Las Vegas on multiple different timelines and maybe even in multiple realities. And we talked about that in that show. And we were really for the first people to talk about certain concepts that have uh, related to that event. And I thought that was a really interesting show we hit on some other stuff that I think we talked about Hugh Hefner and Tom Petty some of the things we got into with Tom Petty were really really interesting and and related to Vegas and I just love those shows with Robert he's well, just you mentioned so um, you know Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell and that plays real heavily into the eclipse and the eclipse if if you would ask me how to define 2017 I would define it with the eclipse yeah largely because whatever you think that event was that to me was the veil being rent and the forks the splitting of people that happened the splitting, in the yeah. weeks before and in the weeks after and the kind of events and drama that were going on really defined the paths that we're taking now um, exactly so yeah. it was that was the watershed event august 21st and the eclipse um Again, it meant a lot of things to a lot of different people, but nobody's, nobody is challenging the fact that it was spectacular on the level of impact that it had energetically on yeah. us. Let, yeah. me, let me do this. Let me share this. Um, let's take time to take a look at, uh, I have this piece of artwork here, and we're going to play this video. Okay, cool. This is a good point to do that. Yeah. Okay, so this is the cover. Ooh. Most people have never heard of this band in the U.S. They're a British band. They're considered to be post-rock. The band is Mogwai. They have about... Oh, I love Mogwai, yeah. Mogwai. And, and so this album actually came out on September 1st, 11 days after the do you know, eclipse do you know what that also looks like and you and i were just talking about this with jeff the other day the way that eclipse looks like looks like the way the heptapods in arrival would ink out the symbols that were embedded with meaning it looks almost exactly like that that's fascinating what's interesting about this album cover then i actually have the vinyl album i wish i'd have brought it in with me i'd show you i bought it the 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 die cut album that it comes with the vinyl record actually has an expansion of this graphic. I saw okay. this graphic two weeks before the eclipse. And when I saw it, my jaw dropped yep. and I looked at what it was representing. Now this goes into 
a number of things. It goes into aspects of time, which we've been talking about. It goes into aspects of the world inside the world, and it goes into inversions, which is something we kind of touch on a lot. We haven't talked about it, about how important truths are veiled a lot of times in inversions. So we look at this cover, and you see here the clips. And remember, this album jacket was designed probably six months before the eclipse in order to get it to press. Yeah. This, this graphic and the video we're going to watch were released at least three weeks to a month before the eclipse. So this album cover is very interesting. You look at it, you see the eclipse, you see this chasm going down into the earth. You see what looks like uh, terrain here. But watch what happens once you invert it. Oops, inverted it too much. One more. There we go. All of a sudden, we have the secret sun inside the yeah. earth shooting up like a column. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now you have a city. Yeah. Wow. Good one, Randy. So we're going to take a Let's break here. It. We're going to take a break here. I want to play you the featured track off of the Mogwai album, um, Every Country Sun. And uh, the song is called Party in the Dark, ironically enough. We'll come back <laughs> and then we'll- Sounds good to we'll, me, Party we'll in the line Dark. Us, we'll line all this up on the other side.
That was awesome video, Andy, and very cool uh, image and whatnot. Yeah. So um, thanks for sharing that. And picking back up where we were after that uh, ritual Americanus with Robert, then I got into, the next thing that I kind of did was I got into the whole thing with Kara, with the Sugar is Programmable Matter. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, it's been really fun to work with Kara on that series. And I don't, I think, I don't think we're done. I think, you know, as things come up, we'll create more. Um, but I like the energy between she and I, and I really appreciate her um, offering me her platform and supporting me in um, starting to really yank at a thread that I think is going to be central to my work, both individually and here on the show going forward. And um, doing it with her has been fun. And I love um, all of the interesting interaction I've had with people based on the concepts that I put forward. Um, in those shows, and I um, thank you, Kara. I really appreciate you being really supportive of me and, um, and and helping me sort of flesh out these ideas. And we had that other show with Sophia Smallstorm about WikiLeaks and biomes and biological darkness, and it's always an interesting time with Miss Sophia. I love uh, you know, yeah, and, then, yeah. and and then we had the you know another with Kara with the uh, egregore and some other concepts we talked about, and then you you got back in touch with Tony Topping and did a show with Tony after many, many yeah. years. And that was a return was to cool. Roots show. And yeah. Tony's evolving too. You know, he kind of understands now the connection of MK Ultra to ufology. He's sort of getting to the place where he's parsing, parsing this again, you know, in the Don't margins, yeah. in the margins of all of this is my labs. And yeah. even defining my labs is very difficult, difficult because the people who were part of my labs have no confirmation and probably never will because my labs itself was a cover operation. Yeah. Much like the secret space program. Again, we have to conclude, or we at least have to consider that much of what was been presented, even in our own personal testimonies about anything related to black projects, UFOs, my labs, all of this is cover programming with screens that go screens. layers deep. And that's the, and also one of the things that I noticed about Tony Tony early, earlier, and I think he's pulling at the strings and, and putting this yeah. stuff together, is that also the relationship of being a targeted individual to this. And, exactly. And how yeah. target, a, a targeted individual can also have experiences projected at them. They don't even actually have to be things that really happen. They can be projected right. simulated, holographic experiences that can seem as real as anything you might experience. And I, I like Tony. Like, I feel like he's a little different than your general experiencer kind of, you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. feel like he, he yeah. has really kind of stuck to it, stayed true to himself. And, and I think this, he's, this is the most important thing for him in his life is to sort of figure out yeah. what was happening with him. You know, a lot of people thought, and it was said to me by another talk show host early on, when I launched this after, after kind of closing down threshing floor, he said, oh, congratulations on your new UFO show. And I said, well, it's not <laughs> really a, a UFO show. It started out that way. And it started out that way because that was me scratching yeah. at the surface of my own experiences. Yeah. You know, and right off of the bat, I wind up talking to Bob Dean. Yeah. That and was a great show. Bob Dean outs me right in the show and says, well, I guess you've had your own experiences, haven't you, young man? Yeah. So, uh, and Bob, you know, I know, I know it's tenuous with Bob Dean. We, we send you love and energy as well. Yeah, um, that was a great show. I mean, I remember, I, I mean, I, I've listened to pretty much every show you've ever done. So there's a lot of these that I listened to were way back before any long before I, we ever were in touch with each other. And, you know, at that, you know, for me, um, I, I came to you not so much because of UFO stuff, because of other stuff, but then listen. Probably to, more in spite of it. In spite but, of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. But you know what I have to say that I'm because I like you and the way you presented information so much, I a lot, I, I, I listened to you, those shows, whereas with, for the most part, I had avoided most of this alien and UFO stuff. And I was glad I did because there was very important data points in there as well. And as I was starting to understand more and more how this worked and what mind control was and what MKUltra was and what projected experiences and secret space programs and unacknowledged black stuff programs were, those were really important. And there, you know what? There's absolutely some data points from some of those shows that as shocked as I was, match certain experiences that they're I've all had, parts you know? of the puzzle it's all we part don't, of the puzzle. we don't have we, we we can't hand 
you a map of this thing. Yeah. What so we're doing is we're scratching at the surface of something. Scratching at it, yeah. Yeah, scratching at it, literally with a stick sometimes. <laughs> All right. So let me pull you back into where you want to go with the narrative and uh, so we don't... Uh, okay, so... So then, there, then we, we had the show with Bear, and I want to say a huge thank you to Bear for yeah, really going yeah. farther with us than he'd gone with anyone so far. And he's still in the early stages of, of really talking about his experiences more publicly. I think he's a very genuine, very nice guy who obviously yeah. you know, has been through quite a lot, and we consider Bear to be part of our family. And um, we got a lot of really yeah. excellent um, interaction from other listeners and from people sending us emails after hearing that show that were very affected by the whole show. And um, yeah. so we want to thank Bear for uh, trusting us enough to, um, you know, get raw with us. And so thank you. Yes. Um, and then the next guy, speaking of raw, the next show was Drive, Drive Time Shaman with Raw. And man, I, there, I have a special place in my heart for Raw Castaldo. Like, he's almost as annoying as me, not, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> he's, right? He's like, oh, he talks a lot. He's the male uh, Emily Moyer. Yeah. But yeah. I, you know, like, I, I, just, I, I really enjoy him. I like talking to him. Um, I haven't seen so many of his morning videos lately. I think he's about to have a kid, so maybe there haven't been. So I, or maybe YouTube unsubscribed yeah. me from him or something because they haven't been coming up in my feed, and I kind of miss them. But Rock Estaldo, we love you, and there'll be many more uh, shows with you in the in the future. And then we had our obligatory, and I don't mean this in any way uh, to again, but our obligatory finally a chemtrail show this year with Matt Landman. And we've been looking forward to that for a while because he's kind of an interesting new face. And guys, the spraying is so out of control right now. Like, I've, it's like nothing I've ever seen. At least here it is. Like, yeah, this is getting, crazy. like, to me, like, I don't, like, I, I was driving home tonight wondering, like, are we going to do something about this? What can we do? It's like, it's just getting worse and worse. And it seems to be, not in so in some ways more talked about than it was a few years ago but in other ways not as much and matt seems to be spearheading sort of that i mean i, I, I sometimes i just feel like i want i mean i don't know who you'd go to but i kind of want to find someone to go to and just say like <coughs> see that all this shit up there like, you can do that wherever you want but you can't do it where i am because i'm not okay with that and you know i mean like i just it sounds like stupid obviously it sounds like a stupid thing to say but like how is it that like we're allowing a very small group of people to just completely poison our air. Like I don't want it. You don't want it. Like they're not just poisoning our air. They're literally building a thermionic screen around a us. A space fence. A spa uh, Alana Freeland is right. There's yeah. a space fence. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, this is basically the building of the cage around us if we allow it to continue. Electromagnetic energy, chemicals, heavy metal toxins. Project and, Blue Beam. Uh, and you guys probably had Blue Beam uh, out in LA this week with that, that UFO uh, that showed up. I mean, with that SpaceX, with that, right? Elon's Musk. That's, that was not <laughs> SpaceX, and that was not a missile launch. Um, having were, looked they, at they, different they were, they were videos, dusting, they were dusting the sky. They were dusting the sky. Yeah. That was a test run towards, um, and not in. Uh, major coincidence there that it occurred on the heels of major media like Fox News, MSNBC, and ABC breaking UFO stories, that this right. would occur so blatantly in the skies and there, over LA. And there was people like, people, people think, I, like somebody, somebody sent me a text saying that their friend thought they saw a UFO over Hollywood and Highland, and other people yeah. were like, didn't, you know, and everyone at my restaurant that night, because it was Friday, it was like Friday night at the restaurant, everyone was, you know, was like, oh, did you see the UFO? Did you see the thing in the sky? Like my friend Mia, like almost got in a car accident, because there's a three car pilot, because the people were looking at that, so they want to see yeah. it. It's, yeah, what, whatever it was. You're now being entrained to look at the sky, but you're being entrained to look at false objects. You know, anybody that ha is a UFO observer like me, I've, I've stood and watched things in the sky that other people around me, they couldn't see them. And, and this is all entrainment. Um, your visioning was entrained as a child when you were taught to look at a chalkboard and then a TV set, and then a computer screen, and you were taught how to see and what to see and, all right and in front when of you, to not see. Not the periphery and all that kind of stuff. You were taught and, to look ahead of you and to end where the borders ended, as opposed to like paying attention to what's behind us and to the side of us and all of that kind of crap. Yeah. And so disclosure, according to the mainstream media and according to the ruling 
cabal will be what they tell you it is and how to look at it. And you're going to have to learn to look behind the scenes and to deconstruct it. Yep. So that's why these things are important. And that's why we blend all of these different things into the, into the show, because ultimately you need to break programming in order to actually see what this, this, this realm, this, this, this earth is and how it functions and operates and what really goes on behind that very thin veil that got ripped in half by the eclipse in August. Yep. Yep. So then after that with Matt, we were, that, then we had our show with Cliff and Danny, which we've already talked about, followed by our group discussion with Danny McKinney and Jeff Gates, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's led to some really cool stuff going on in the background that we've been talking about and using some of the concepts related to blockchain to talk about other things because that maybe it's more useful in that. And that conversation will go on. And then we, you know, we had our show part two of time with Cliff and people are still chewing on that we've had people turn we've had people turn in notes we've yeah had we, we turn we, in we, notes on that show yeah because you know and, and some of them were very interesting and pointed out some things to us that we hadn't really even picked up on in our own words in our own show because yeah. there's yeah. so there's there's layers of text and layers of consciousness being spreaded through here and then you know we did a show with chris kaler that um has been up for patrons that will go out on youtube sometime this week and yep. then um this this we did recorded a show the other day with Sam, Sonia Barrett, which by the time you get this show will be out, and then this is the last show of the year. So this now that it. we've sort of reviewed all of that, Randy, what do you think of the whole thing, and what do you think's coming up for us next? I think we've had an amazing year. Yeah. I think if you step back and look at 2017 and the events that we've talked about, but obviously that's a, a bigger picture, and each person's story is individual assess this year from the standpoint that the veil has been ripped, that what began in 2012 is now wide open. And they can't stop it. They're going to try and window dress it. We're going to try and expose it. And the place we do that is inside of our own consciousness, our own hearts, and by opening up our eyes and beginning, begin to look again at things in a way that we were not taught to do. And so 2017, the veil was ripped. And um, what is coming over the course of the next 24 months leading up to 2020, because there is an agenda for 2020. And there's no way around this. The elites mapped us out a long time ago. The 2012 scenario was the gateway. The portal was the four years, and we forgot about the four-year loop, but that's been going on this year as well. Yeah. And that was an attempt to basically pull people back into the cattle gates again so that they weren't nosing around where they shouldn't be. <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, not, We're yeah. not getting this, this Sarah. There will be no financial uh, liberation of the people by the cabal. There'll be no uh, draining of the swamp. There'll be no, no draining of the swamp. <laughs> nope. Uh, no mass arrests. None of that stuff. None yeah. of that stuff. No. Yeah. There's going to be no restoring the Republic. There's going to be none of, none of that shit. Yeah. <laughs> so this year, I'm calling um, basically the year of reckoning. Yeah. Uh, the financial system, in my opinion, cannot survive the rigors that it's undergone this year. Bitcoin blockchain is part of this reckoning. But ultimately, I think a year from now, we're going to be looking at Bitcoin quite a bit differently than we do right now. I think that's a sump pump to siphon off the excess capital that's floating around out there. I think our government knows it. I think they're attempting to deal with it. And I think that this is an experiment right now to see how far they can take us in adopting something that's so intangible that it only exists in cyberspace yeah don't fall for it don't fall for it yeah so i agree the been an incredible year and thank you all for participating thank in it you. and um there You're was amazing one yeah there's one last thing that i wanted to do here seems like a little off tangent but i you know have some things i'm wanting to say and this just seemed like the right place to do it um and so um you guys heard me several times this year speak about my friend ann baroque who died um, she is the author of the Candida Cure, and um, she, you know, as I've already discussed, and you guys know that, you know, she was a big influence on me because of 
you know, how she helped me pull my health together and whatever. Um, and I appreciate her for that as do many hundreds and thousands of other people that she helped, but that actually isn't really why she's um, was so important to me or so special to me. And I kind of wanted to share why she was here and do like a little tribute to her because that's been the biggest thing that happened to me this year. It's been had the huge effect on me. I'm still struggling. I am not over it by any means. I don't know if I ever will be. Um, but I wanted to kind of share the story with you guys. So I, I, I went to Anne as, as a client and um, we hit it off very quickly. Um, and, you know, very quickly I, you know, started to regain health. I'd been not in good health, you know, just from years of destructive behaviors, but also just, you know, shit that someone like me, things that happen, you know, my health had gone from, I'd been a very athletic, healthy person to being someone who hardly ever got out of bed. She helped me with that and that was immediate. Um, but we hit it off and we became friends um, and pretty tight friends pretty quickly and spent a lot of time together and um, had some amazing conversations and um, just it was a special time. And, but the, for the, the problem was, is that one of the things that happened, and I've talked about this a little bit on the shows with Kara, when my body got really quickly, really healthy and really clean, my programming started breaking down really, really hardcore. And, and so some of the destructive behaviors that I had been engaged in before I met her and uh, I had kind of stopped for a while when I was just sort of first getting the health thing under control. But as the programming broke down and memories were surfacing that I was having trouble dealing with, some destructive behaviors continued. And um, I was lying to her about that. She, you know, she was suspicious that I was still harming myself in a multitude of ways, and she was correct. And I wasn't wanting to admit that to myself. I was not always... Um, the healthy, well-adjusted, happy person that I am now. And I've been through a lot of shit as a lot of you who are in our community have also been through way, things much more complicated even than what I've been through. And Anne was a really special person. She was extremely psychic. She was in my head from the moment I first, well, I remember the first day I walked into her office, I saw her and I was like, oh my God, I could just tell like psychically, like my life was never gonna be the same and, and it never was. Um, and she was crawling around in my head the very first appointment. So I don't know why I ever, I mean, I never, I don't think I ever really thought I could get away with lying to her and she wasn't going to know. And because um, it wasn't really about lying to her. It was about me lying to myself because I wasn't yet ready to deal with all of the shit that I was going to have to deal with. And so I lied to her and she figured it out and she kicked me out of her life. And it was devastating for me. Um, and in that period of time, for about a year, I continued some of the destructive behaviors. You know, I pretty much maintained the level of health that she had helped me to regain, but I was continuing doing destructive behaviors and I'm not dealing with myself, not, you know, it's a really scary period of time you're in when you realize what's going on in your life. And then before you start talking about it, that's like kind of the hardest and scariest part. And there wasn't a single day that went by where I didn't feel bad about lying to her, but I couldn't really do anything about it because I wasn't ready to deal with myself. Like I could go and apologize to her and say I lied, but then it would be, you know, prob I, I, wasn't re I wasn't ready to completely change my behavior. And so I suffered both with, you know, being isolated with being able to talk about some of the things that were going on with me, continuing, continuing to destroy myself, and also feeling bad about having lied to this person that had helped me so much and that I very much cared about. And about a year, year and a half after, I w had pulled myself together and had uh, made some big changes in my life. And those changes basically got to the point where I could not live with the fact that I had lied to, that I had lied to this person who'd helped me and that I cared about. And that was one of the huge prime motivating factors in me turning my life around. And and really, since that day, I've kind of you know, it's not that I'm perfect and I still struggle with stuff and whatever, but I'm honest with myself now about that and I'm honest with the people around me that I care about about you know what my life has been and what's been going on and 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 whatnot and um you know it really helped me come to this place of understanding that if there's something that I don't feel comfortable telling the truth about maybe it's not something I should be doing <laughs> you know what I mean and um it I would not be able to sit here and do the show the way I do with Randy, none of this, none, none of this, I would never have contacted Randy if I hadn't had this experience with Anne where I had to learn to deal with myself. And about a year and a half afterwards, I contacted her and kind of apologized and whatnot. And um, 
we started occasionally having an email or text message once in a while, but she had moved on with her life and was moved, had moved to New York for career purpose things and whatnot. And, you know, it was tremendously sad to me that I had, you know, lost that person in my life. Um, and I always hoped that there'd be, you know, an opportunity for us to, you know, come together again. Um, and, but I also appreciated the lesson and, um, and I knew that it would never happen again because that, that lesson had been so harsh. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and I had mentioned a few times on the show, that just in passing, my, the diet or her, her book and people, I'd started getting a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, questions about it. And so I decided, you know what? It's been a long time. I'm going to send her an email and see if she'll come on the show because it's silly for me just to keep talking about it. Let's have her on. And I sent her an email not knowing that she had moved back to Los Angeles. Um, and she contacted me back right away and said, of course, she'd do the show, but that she would like to see me. And, and I went and I saw her and I got, you know, I got to apolo really apologize to her. And the most important thing that I got to thank her for was um, for being the first person in my life to hold me truly responsible for my behavior. And as painful and as embarrassing and torturous as it was, um, it was the kick in the ass that I needed to pull my shit, to get my shit together. I wouldn't be sitting here doing this in the condition that I am if it weren't for her doing that. And all the other people in my life that I've, all the other friends I've had, and there's been people that have, you know, little bit sometimes held me responsible for stuff and whatever, but not in the way that like really forced change. And um, I love her for that. And I will never forget. I will, I think about her every day. I miss her. Um, you know, fortunately we, I, we, I got to completely apologize and tell her how I felt and we made up and, you know, I got to have, you know, some time with her and, and some conversations with her and, and whatnot before, you know, things kind of went south and it's, you know, I'm really sad. I miss my friend and I'm sorry for the time that was wasted because I couldn't be honest with myself, but I know that things happened in the way that they had to happen for, for me to change. And I, and I love you and I thank you so much for, for being a true friend, for being, you know, sometimes a true friend isn't just like playing along and letting you do it, get away with the shit you do. It's holding you responsible for your behavior because they know that you can be much more than what you are at that moment. And I will never forget her for that. And, and thank you. And I just wanted to share that. And, um, uh, you know, she's a huge inspiration for all the things that I'm doing. And um, I, I'm going to be moving into the, I'm going to go back to school and get a CNC and work in the nutrition field. And that's because of her. Like, I feel like that people, you know, I, I feel like there's something I can help people with and people seem to like talking to me about that. And um, if in some small way I can carry on some of her work, but in my own way, it's never going to be, it's never going to be like what she did, but my own thing, um, then, you know, I would love to be able to do that. And so thank you, Anne, for the inspiration and for being my friend. And I hope you're happy and at peace wherever you are. I love you. We're a composite of all the people that we meet in our lives and they intermingle with us in ways we don't understand. And yeah. uh, it's a perfect way to end what has been a tumultuous and yet very exciting year. And uh, we wish you all the best in the coming year. I hope you'll join us in this journey and uh, we'll close it out as we always do. The truth is out there, it's inside you. Use it, now's the time. Thanks guys, on the other side, we love you.